Hello, everybody. Welcome to Three Point Perspective, the podcast about illustration, how to do it, how to make a living at it, and how to make an impact in the world with your art. I'm Jake Parker. I'm Lee White. And I'm Will Terry. And all three of us are professional illustrators. We've all worked for all the major publications in the business, or publishers, I should say. We've uh, together published somewhere around 75 books, and we've all taught illustration at university art schools. Each week, we come at you guys with questions about illustration. Sometimes we agree, sometimes we argue, but each time you're going to learn something brand spanking new. So we, so yesterday, I know this is way, way past the, the, the Kickstarter dates. It's probably being delivered now by the time you're hearing this podcast episode. But yesterday for us, Lee launched his Kickstarter. <laughs> and how do you think that first day went? We're at... Uh, almost 24 hours now since 24 the launch. hours. Yeah. It, I mean, I, I had no idea what to expect. So it's hard to, it's hard to think, or it's hard for me to figure out whether it's like super successful or not successful. It funded in two hours, which was awesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so we had, yeah, was that a work. real funding number? Like it was $6,000 and was that like a real number or was mm -hmm. it just like an arbitrary, I need no, it was, it was a real number. That was, that was my minimum. I figured out what my minimum amount of decks I would need and how much the cost would be to do it. So like a thousand run of the decks would be that amount. And so rough mm. give or give or take. I mean, there's a lot of right. estimating going on in there. Oh yeah. Um, so it was that, so it was real, it was a real number. And then shipping is not included in that. So in Kickstarter is weird. So sometimes you can either include the shipping and it makes you look like your funding is more, or you do the shipping later. And so this is real mm -hmm. funding. Like the shipping is not included in stuff. So a single yeah. day we had, we're at 16,000 now that's for tw the first 24 hours. So I, I mean, I'm happy with it. It's more than my last project did for the whole campaign. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. yeah. so it did. Okay. Yeah. We'll that's great. Cool. You but just got another a... sale. Nice. Did you buy something? But that's now. And when people are listening to this, that sale happened long ago, long yeah. ago. So by the time people do hear this episode, this thing will be available in your online shop, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll be it'll be available. And I'm getting some inquiries about that, you know, shipping the 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 decks to different stores and stuff like that. So that's kind of cool. I will say this, me and Will were talking about this before Jake uh, joined us on this the Zoom session, but the weird thing that you don't anticipate is how sort of emotionally vested you are in, in a project like this. Mm -hmm. So when you, when you, when you go live, it is a very public success or failure and it is all on your shoulders, shoulders. Like I never feel the same pressure mm -hmm. when I have a book come out that a publisher's doing. And you know, there's whole teams of people involved and I'm just a part of it, even though I did the illustration, which yeah. is a big part of it, but I just don't feel that, that, <clears throat> you know, the weight of it on mm -hmm. my shoulders, like I do in a Kickstarter, like I actually am sick right now. Um, for the first time in years, just because like, it's just so, there's just so the many stress. things to consider. <laughs> yeah. And when you first fail? got on this morning, I was like, Oh, his voice sounds like he's been stressing a little bit. No, I've been, it's, it's, it's weird. And it's super <laughs> stressed. I actually had an ocular migraine earlier today. Have you guys ever had one of those? Yes. Is that I like where love, you have I tentacles love. coming out of your back? I do. Yep. Yeah. You and you have a headache at the same them, time or something. Right <laughs> um, hold on. I'm thinking I'm going to sneeze. Um, no, it's where it's, it's where there's like a little fuzzy feel. It'll start out as a little dot in the middle in of your, your vision. In your vision. Right. Yeah. And so you'll notice it because like I'm looking at my phone, say for example, and you literally holding your phone straight out in front of you, you can't see it. Like there's a void in your field of vision. Mm -hmm. And so it's if I move so it to weird. the side, you can see it. And then you move it past the front of your eyes and you can't see it. It literally disappears from your view. And you the first drive, time that man. happened years ago, no, you definitely shouldn't drive. But then it's kind of fuzzy around the edges, like almost like really bright and rainbow colored. If you look at if if anybody Googles ocular migraine, they've made some great videos on YouTube that show kind of hypoth like it's a mock-up sort of of what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. But the first time I had it yeah. happen, I was like, oh my God, I'm dying. I don't know what's yeah, happening. Same here. I was at an <laughs> yes. airport. I remember exactly where I was when I'm like, what is going on? And I called my wife. I'm like, oh, I think I'm dying. And she's all, no, no, no. <laughs> You're going to be fine. Yeah. No, no. All, just, I had never even sure. heard so, of it before that. But uh, Sometimes yeah, so, so, they follow up with an actual like pain migraine, but sometimes I don't get those. Right. I'll just get like, I'll just get weird and tired and 
Yeah. yeah, it's like 50% of the people, that's a precursor to a full migraine. And those mm-hmm. people I feel sorry for. For me, now that I know what it is, when it's starting to happen, I just sit back and enjoy the show. It's like a light show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of cool. <laughs> it's like, like a light show. You don't have anyway, to do shrooms. You just, it comes you on just... with stri- yeah, it's natural <laughs> shrooms. But it, uh, it, it, I mean, it's brought on by stress and, and all that kind of stuff. So I don't know. It's just kind of funny because you never, you, you hear people talking about like, you know, Will Terry, how to do a kickstart. Here's all the buttons you got to check and here's all the things, you know, <laughs> but then there's this emotional side of it that is extreme. It's weird. Yeah. For me, yeah. it is. I don't know if it was like that for you guys. Oh, it's extreme. Yeah, it's super pressure. I mean, I, I've i done four or five Kickstarters now, uh, helped my son with a Kickstarter. And every time I always uh, like, I always think, oh, I could... I could kind of do other stuff while I do the Kickstarter, but it is so encompassing. Like you have to clear your schedule mm-hmm. for the first couple of days for sure. And then the last couple of days for sure. And then in between you can kind of relax a little bit, but, um, but it is, it's, it's like every day you're checking it. You're like, what, you know, what's it going to do today? You know, did I make more money? Did I lose money? Is, right. there, is it working? You know, yeah. Is it, di- is there is it dead right now? That I got to deal with. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so congrats. I think, thank I you, think you. it's a good one. I think you're going to, you're going to do just fine. And, um, and, uh, I'm excited to see where this ends up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, me too. Cool. Uh, okay, so let's get into these uh, these questions we got from our folks here. First question comes in from Eric. Uh, Eric, titled Illustrator for Life. Greetings. <coughs> Recently graduated from art school. I have a BFA, which I received in 2005, and an MFA, which I just received, both in illustrations. I have been creating art for many years, and I am skilled and confident painter. My style is very realistic. I have geared my portfolio towards book covers and advertising. I'm sending out emails and postcards to art directors, and I still have not found any work. This slow start is making me doubt my life's work and my ability as an artist. I am fully committed, so quitting or giving up is not an option. Financially, I'm in a good place. I have zero debt and can focus on this path 100%. What are some things I could do to get some work? And do you think my portfolio is good enough? Love the podcast. Thanks for your help. Respectfully, Eric. I I love starting out with this kind of a question and being able to look at a portfolio Mm -hmm. and being able to give advice. So I'm curious to see what you guys would say. I definitely have my own thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. And I was looking at this guy's stuff uh, a couple of weeks ago when I, you know, when I first saw this question going through it and I feel like his he really is nailing um a certain style and he's got the light and shadow and everything down um compositions are fine i could see this guy really getting work for for book covers i think the problem is is this like heavy um leaning like heavy reliance on photography like Mm like um photo reference and i don't know if he's taking his own photos or if he's um you know using um, stock photos or something like that but um they there's a little bit of lifelessness from leaning so hard on the on the photos for the illustration when he doesn't so like there's this image of a zombie which you can't you can't take a picture of a zombie you have to like bring Mm -hmm. your imagination into it and kind of riff and and do stuff that one i think has so much more um life to it and like interestingness to it than you know one where it's straight up really good lighting really you know really solid color and and shadow and everything like that but very stiff and very posed Mm -hmm. and um and so i think if i were to keep working on this if i were to give him advice on on next the next you know six portfolio pieces that he's going to do it would be shy (laughs) away from the photo stuff um it still use photo reference but but refer to it (coughs) you know don't marry that reference you don't have Mm -hmm. to do an exact um uh you know exact one-to-one copy of it 
Mm-hmm. That's that's sort of my take there. Uh, that, I agree. And that just is that's just talking about his style. That said, you could still get tons of work with the portfolio that you have here. So I'm I'm curious what you think may be the disconnect between his portfolio and actually getting work. Can you give me a share and screen privileges? Yeah. Go for it. Right when I saw his work, I wanted to um, here. Let me just pull up my whole screen and nothing but the screen. So help me, God. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's really stupid. Um, okay, so I've got here's his work here. We can show his work, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, good. I didn't know. Um, so we're good. on we're on on YouTube. We're on uh, Society of Visual Storytelling uh, channel. Yeah. Yeah, so I immediately thought of uh, of Dan Dos Santos. You guys know his stuff. Mm-hmm. Very, 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 can I emphasize very similar style as this. I mean, look at the, mm-hmm. these two. You could almost say that this, you know, on the right was Dan eight years ago mm-hmm. or whatever, before he leveled up to what this one was. And so I think the one thing that I would do, well, there's two things I would do. One is look at somebody who is working in a very realistic style and see what the one difference is. And the one difference that I see with, with Dan stuff is that his lighting is exceptional. Mm-hmm. I mean, like if you're going to work in this realistic style, doesn't mean you can't be a, a cinematographer or a lighting director mm-hmm. like, like Will Terry does in, in his work. I mean, there's, there's streaming light. There's like, when you look at the glow that, you know, this, this guy on the right, I'm describe this image. It's this guy sitting down, and all these books and candles are around him and stuff is floating and he's holding this like glowing orb in between his hands, but it's not really glowing. It's lit, but it's not glowing. Mm -hmm. You look at Dan's stuff and there's this like glow that happens with all, all the stuff. There's this kind of luminosity, like the hair right here. Um, It's just one level up on the color balance and the ability to make things interesting and glow, but it's a very, very similar style. So I think this guy is super close yeah. to being able to mimic it. So that's the first thing is I would just level up can, a little can bit with the lighting. Can I interject something on yeah, there, yeah. Lee, before you keep going? Um, with this particular image, you're spot on. You're 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 actually stealing what I was going to say, which is fine because, you know, we're on the same page on color and lighting. And like, like on this image, the color is just dead, you know. But more than that, I think just having a, a, a kid – in regular jeans and regular a regular shirt doesn't excite and with your portfolio like like will you get asked to do an assignment like this where it's just a regular kid and regular clothes yes you'll always be asked to do a dumb illustration right <laughs> but don't right. display that in your portfolio do something more fantastical more exciting because what happens is the art directors see your really exciting work and they've been handed a dead project a dumb illustration that they have to assign. So they look at, they want to look at, at something that's amazing in, in mm-hmm. costume and in, 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 in flair. Yeah. Yeah. Who's his character? I mean, right now yeah. he looks almost like this looks like the photo ref, like Jake yeah. was saying, it's a little yeah. too close to the photo ref. So who is this character? And, and, but, you know, we just got to level the work up a little bit, but the next thing I would do before I forget my train of thought yeah, go ahead. is, um, I would immediately look to, again, Dan Dos Santos and people like that. Where are they getting work? Because that guy's been working forever mm-hmm. and he's he does a ton of He does do a lot of book covers. He does games. He works for uh, uh, D&D and all these different- See um, who's representing him if he's got a rep, you know? Right, right. Right, because this skill set, there's no reason why the why er, this person can't be getting work. I mean, there's no right. reason. Because well, I'm sure like that guy's turning down jobs, you know? And so- in the meantime, while well, you're, well, you, Dan? Um, Dan, yeah, Dan, yeah. what's his name? Los Santos. Dan, Dan Dos Santos. Dos Santos. Like, I'm sure, like, while you're getting up to speed and you're, and you're improving your stuff, like, you could, you could get his table scraps, you know, mm-hmm. and that's going to right. give you, all of a sudden you've got an assignment where now you're not just doing portfolio piece, you're also doing paid, a paid thing. And then you turn that into your next portfolio piece, mm-hmm. really plus it. You, you take it to a place you haven't taken your art before, and that's going to lead you to to some bigger and better stuff. The nice thing about this is we could look at your your work and say, oh, there's so much potential here. And yeah. there's sometimes we look at portfolios and we're like, well, first thing, go back and learn perspective. Right. <laughs> 
Okay, next, <laughs> you're going to want to really understand volumes and shapes. Right. <laughs> you don't have to do any of that. It's it's really that last 10% of polish that um, that is going to make a 90% difference. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, the, 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 the thing that happens, I think, when you go this route where it's more realistic is your skill level has to be extremely high to mm-hmm. even come close to pulling this off. Mm-hmm. So he's probably looking around going, I am more advanced than so many artists out there. And yeah. you are in the skill level. But when you're competing for the photorealistic kind of, it has to be... It has to hit on every mark. And I guess what we're saying is um, poses is the next thing, color mm-hmm. um, and costume and and just uh, flair. Uh, you know, grandiose is a word that comes to mind. One thing that you should do is go into the bookstore and, you know, find the book covers that look like the kind of book covers you wish you were doing and, yeah, and do a hard comparison on yours and theirs. I mean, I I tend to want to steer them towards someone like Brandon Dorman, mm-hmm. but who, if you look at the color, I mean, he's using um, you know cotton candy kind of colors, and you may not like that. But the one of the reasons why Brandon is constantly turning down work, I mean, his plate is always full, and he makes a really good living. I mean, a really good living as a as an illustrator. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and, uh, and, and one of the reasons is he's, he's proficient and he's doing the things that we're talking about. Yeah. And, and, um, it's, it's not to say that you should, you know, try to copy him or, or modify, but, but try to figure out why he's getting work and see if there are things that you can incorporate, um, into your work that he's doing. Cause you're, mm-hmm. I mean, it, and once you establish a relationship with, an art director and you nail one, you'll get repeat work. And I have a feeling that in a, in, in a year or two, after making some changes and still heavily marketing your work, you get a couple of breaks and all of a sudden you're going to have these uh, regular clients that come back, um, is assuming that you nail their assignments, yeah. which. I got one, one more little piece yeah. too. And it, it goes right along with Will. Like it wouldn't hurt to, to, try and do a handful of, of pieces that are straight from your imagination, no photo reference whatsoever. Some like Brandon, Brandon doesn't, Brandon Dorman, there's no way he's using photo Mm -hmm. reference Mm -mm. for, and his stuff really looks nicely rendered and lit and, Mm -hmm. and everything he understands, you know, maybe there is like, he might look at something absolutely just as reference like mm-hmm. there's no way he could copy that and make you know the proportions are different the perspective is different so i would look at that i would look at like comic covers you know things where things are really pushed but then if you are you know wanting to lean still on photography and especially your own photos i would study cinematography i would take some photo you know, some photography classes that teach you how to better use light because i'm looking at some of these where i'm just like there's a there's a piece here where a guy's eating um a hamburger and there's a kid over the fence looking at him and the guy in the foreground is he you know the subject matter there he's not lit like he mm. has backlighting on him and you would never do that if you were just doing it from your imagination. Mm -hmm. But because your photo is showing that this guy has, you know, uh, dappled light on him, but his face is like in shadow, you're, you're relying on that photo than, than what would be more common sense to do if you were just working from your imagination. So I think having like some photography classes too would, would maybe help, help you understand how to use light a little bit better with whatever photos you're taking. So it's, it could be a little, it could make the difference from I'm using, you know, uh, I, I, I know how to push a button on my SLR to like get a photo to, I know how to do the white balance. I know how to do the reflect reflection light. I know how to do all the different things that photographers do to, to really plus, plus their images. And then mm-hmm. you can go in and, and apply that to, some really cool compositions and some more imaginative stuff. Anyway, 
This guy's right. one, this guy's one year away from being mm-hmm. probably you know super busy and turning down work himself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So his website, if you guys want to check it out, is Eric C. Berg Art. So it's E R I C S E A B U G A R T dot com. All right, next question. This comes from Alexander, Alex Mitchell. He says, what kind of dummy should I be taken for? I love your podcast, and I've listened to every episode, albeit only once. That's fine. <laughs> Have you guys listened to every episode? I I have it on repeat, just in the background all day. <laughs> I guarantee these guys have have could count on one hand the amount of episodes they've actually listened to all the way no, through. Oh no, I think I think most of the emails we get, if you listen to one of our episodes, you're going to listen to all of them. That's my best. That's true. <laughs> no, I'm saying you two. You, oh yeah, I've never listened to us. one ever. No, <laughs> no we, I, don't, we, we don't. Wait, do that. we're recording this. <laughs> it is. <laughs> He, okay, so yes, what kind of dummy should I be taken for? Listen to every episode. I author illustrate books. I love doing it. It keeps me off the streets. Okay, I'm 46 year old family guy, but still, I'm glad it keeps you off the streets. We don't want you out <laughs> doing graffiti on the uh, train cars like those rascals. I've finished two books now. I've got them printed through a company that creates photo albums. I got four copies made for family and for posterity. I also sent PDF versions of the finished books to about 30 of the world's top agents and then to the same number of the best publishing houses. The only positive response I've got so far uh, was from a vanity publisher. And my question is this, am I better off sending a rough dummy with two completely finished images or am I okay to send completed versions? Now he has some reasons he's he's asking this. Uh, Here's the following reasons occur to me. Maybe the agents want to have greater input early on rather than the book being complete. Maybe the publishers feel the same and imagine I won't want to change what I've created. Should I state that I'm willing to forego in advance given that I have, in my opinion, provided a complete book? Would this affect my chances of getting published? Um, And then he follows that up to say, P.S. I think I'm aware of the flaws, reasons why the books weren't taken up, but they have nothing to do with the above issues I'm wrangling with. So... Uh, essentially, he's wondering, do you like why is his finished, completely finished books that he's sending in to publishers and agents not getting, not getting a response? See, the thing that he's not including here is what what do you guys think of this work? But we don't have the work in front of us. I don't I don't see how we could possibly give him meaningful. Well, well I, no, I think I, I think we can generalize a little bit. I mean, based on yeah. what Will's saying there, I totally agree. And the answer is that there's something wrong with your art. I mean, when that's is, that's I the go-to, know. right? I mean, that's what there's we have that. to assume. But there's also, I, um, if I submitted a fully finished book to my agent, she'd have a fit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she'd be <laughs> she'd like, get, yeah, yeah, same. <laughs> you know, and then and then if I. Um, and there's no way she would submit that to a publisher because she respects the craft of the publisher and the editors, you know, everybody that's involved there in making a book. Um, they're going to, they're essentially putting up the cash for the printing, putting up the cash for the publication, um, uh, the, the promotion, um, they're, they're, they're footing the entire bill for it. So you think they're probably going to want some input on that. Of course, the only one that's like responded is vanity, vanity publisher. They're not in the business of making books. They're in the, in the business of like selling a thing. Right. And, and they just need more things to, to sell. A publisher has a portfolio, has a reputation, has, um, you know, has like, all of these it has a style and a, and a, a, a kind of like a you know a look that they're going for or a, a voice that they're going for with the books that they pick and publish and it's usually you know this trust in the editor and the art director and the, the people that they've that they've hired to, to to publish books to make sure that everything is is along the lines of those vision and here you roll up with something completely finished, they're not just going to like push, you know, pull the trigger on 
on that and like, oh, let, let's just put it into into the world. They want to have some feedback, some input, mm-hmm. um, and uh, and go from there. So I don't I don't know that anybody's <coughs> ever done that with a publisher, unless you're like you really have a track record, like you know. I still don't even think that would be the case. I, yeah, I still I, don't there's even think there's that. some faulty reasoning there. If you look at kind of the what he's really saying between the lines is if they're not responding to your to two finished pieces in the dummy, he's saying, well, if I give them the whole thing, then maybe they'll respond. But that is that's really faulty logic. Um mm-hmm. it's like saying if you don't like a couple of bites of a meal, how about I give you the whole plate? Yeah. You're you're gonna like the samples. Even if they're not liking the samples, it's not like they're gonna switch gears and all of a sudden be like, oh my God, this is an amazing thing. Especially when, like Jake said, that's just completely, they, that's just not done in the industry. And the reason is because they don't want to have to change all this finished artwork because you're, what you submit will not be the thing that comes out later. Mm -hmm. Books change a lot uh, because there's a team. It's a, it's a team of people. There's a market. um, There's, there's individual goals for the publisher. Yeah. You're forming a partnership. It's, it's, it's a, you know, you're going into business with these guys. Um, it's not like an angel investor, like where they're just gonna, they just want to give you some seed money and, and have you go off and do your, your publishing. So the real question here is, isn't, should I make a full book book and send it? It's how do I make my samples more interesting? That's the real question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now it might be that, um, it's, it's great if you have like a handful of really cool, like fun concepts, um, it might be in order to get that first deal with an agent that you hire like a, a freelance editor, somebody like that, who will just absolutely offer, offer their services for money and say, you know what, this concept's good, but the way you're executing it isn't so great. We need you to start with the characters doing this you know, to grab the kid's attention. And then we need to do like, you know, save the exposition for later or, you know, kids don't care about exposition. They just want to know about conflict. You know, an editor is going to help you with all that stuff that, that, that really is going to capture the attention of your agent or your, or your future publisher or something like that. So, so that might be an option for you there is to just hire someone to help you fine tune it and, and get it in a, get it into a, a good spot. Um, how do you go about finding that person? Got to know people, I guess. <laughs> no, <laughs> worst advice ever. There, <laughs> I know you got to know people. No, I. I mean, it's. I don't discount. I wouldn't discount LinkedIn, or, um, or any. It, you know, you could go on there and you just do a search for freelance editors and, and then just follow the trail. There's going to be some homework that has to do, you know, that that's probably the first step. And then maybe you find two or three people who aren't exactly the right fit, but and you ask them and, and you ask them about their network and, and it might be, there's three people away from you who, you know, three, um, what is it? Um, not a generation, but, a separation separation three, three people separation. removed yeah. from you um you might have to do it that way so that's that's how i'd handle that well, what kind of people are you asking them to find who are these people a freelance a freelance editor or an editor who does offers is you know maybe it's a an actual editor but they'll offer you know they'll do a take on a side gig or something well same is same is true the reason i was asking that is the same is true for the art and there's something going on there it's not not mm-hmm. hitting. I th- mm-hmm. I mean I th- here I'm gonna be saucy today because I'm kind of sick. You guys okay. ready for this? I'm ready for this. If you're really good, this is not an issue. If you're really good, you send your sample. You still have to act like a business, mm-hmm. and you send the work in, and then people respond, and then things start happening. But the question that I have for someone like this is like, how much investigation have they done? They sent it in, and it didn't work. Mm-hmm. So something's amiss. And so, so you have to start, that's where the legwork comes in. You know, I put out this business, I put out these samples and I didn't get a response. That means there's a problem with the work. And so there's a, there's a a whole series of steps that happens at that point. You have to have a good peer group, a good critique group, people that you trust. And then you have to get paid 
critiques from professionals. To, or, I mean, or if you know somebody, you can get a free one, but it's not going to happen. But getting good critiques is really important mm-hmm. for guiding the work. So what I'm hearing here is it's it's C level work, and that that's the that's the hardest one because C level. And when I say C, I don't mean SEA. I mean A, B, C, D, F kind of level. The C you want level to be above illustrator, C level. <laughs> above C level. <laughs> the C level illustrator has it the worst because that's the person who's really passionate and into it. They're willing to do the work, but sometimes they don't put in the legwork to figure out how to become B and A level work. They're just, mm-hmm. they're working hard, but at a certain point they don't back up and say, okay, I may have to change gears here. I may have to change media. I may have to change my style a little bit. And it's weird because we have this ingrained, um, kind of pounding from the industry and the world really that mm-hmm. you do your style and that's you. And then you put it out there and that's how you get work. But that's not necessarily the case. This is a mm-hmm. product like any, it has to be tailored to an audience like any, Mm-hmm. And that's the, that's the business side of it. You can always do your own personal stuff. And if you're not worried about selling, it doesn't matter. You just do your stuff and, and, and do, do your thing. That's awesome. And, but I'm talking about the person who wants to sell the work, which this person is, there's an audience and yeah. you have to hit that. So some legwork has to happen and your work may have to change. Mm-hmm. Yep. That was, uh, that was the tough love, tough love leave. Sorry. Leave. Well, <laughs> but we, but really we didn't do any good. I, in my opinion, if, if I'm teaching a class, an illustration class, and a student comes up to me and asks for my advice about work they've done, I'm going to go, where's the work? Mm-hmm. I'm just reiterating always, that. And then the reason I'm doing this is for people listening. If you're going to send in a question, please send in a link. Um, because, yeah, we don't have to share it to everybody. but we Yeah, have and you to could say don't it. share it, but you guys can look at it and make comments and keep my name out of it. But really, like, we can't help you. We, uh, yeah. In the end, we really cannot help you without seeing it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And, and back to my, I'll just cap that at the end, my tough love little series. What I used to tell my students at, in college was the A levels, everybody ends up at the exact level that they are in terms of success and ease of success. The people that are truly A level, above average, you know, image makers, mm-hmm. they don't have a problem. They put it out there and they get work. It's awesome for them. They go right in the B level person, you know, gets a little bit of success, has to maybe change a few things. And then they start to get traction, maybe smaller clients than the A level, or it takes a little longer than the A level. And then, and then the C level and then the D level, you know what I mean? So, so everybody ends up appropriately where they should, the industry responds exactly proportional to your art. Mm -hmm. So you got to constantly work to don't, don't think, Oh, nobody's buying work. They are, they just might not be buying it from you. So you got to change. Okay. Should we move on to the next one? Yes, we should. Sufficiently answered. All right. This is a short, short and sweet. It comes from, from Brian learning how to make art late. Any tips for someone learning to draw later in life? I'm 34. That does that seem young to you? Do you see yes. you guys? It's <laughs> everything seems young to me now, now that I'm old. <laughs> I know. I'm, old I'm 34, man. but I remember being 34 and being like, my life is over. <laughs> There's no way I'm ever gonna succeed. I'm I'm I plateaued. Okay, I'm 34 and would like to eventually make my own comic or graphic novel. Should I be focused on skills that help me achieve that goal or should I be learning skills in a more traditional order? I'm trying to run. Am I trying to run before I've learned to crawl? So what, yeah, what do you do? Like specifically um, graphic novels, comics. uh, I mean, that's more my domain, but I mean, this could apply to anything. You know, let's say he wanted to, um, um, We'll get it real simple here. He wants to be a mountain biker. Is it important that he learns how to ride a regular bike first, or should he just hop on a mountain bike and start doing trails, like easy trails? Any bike riding is going to help. Any no, bike but the, but the help. but the specific riding is what's important. I say you don't wait for the. I think a lot of people try to force themselves to sort of eat their broccoli before their dessert, and they mm-hmm. spend so long in the foundation. And it's, don't get me wrong, foundation stuff is great, but go ahead and make the thing, you're still going to use every one of those skills, design, perspective, lighting, all that stuff, but make the thing that you want to make. I I wouldn't, I wouldn't just be like, okay, I'm in, I'm in foundations for two years and I got to, you know, map out my vanishing points. 
Okay, but right. I got to say this. So I actually went mountain biking this morning. So I'm qualified to answer your analogy. Oh. Yeah. When did you last go mountain biking, Lee? <laughs> yeah. When Yesterday. did you? <laughs> See, it's been 24 hours for you. Um, no, the thing is like riding on a dirt, easy dirt. Like I've taken a lot. Of, I, I, um, I used to mountain bike every day in Utah, up, mm-hmm. up, up the canyons um, from in my 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. Uh, and so How um, old are you now? 70 and something? <laughs> <laughs> but I used to take people, I, I, I used to have like what I thought were basic skills, really, really, really. And I would take them on what I thought was an easy trail and they would, they would not have a good time. And I had to really learn like, okay, when, when I bring, when someone comes out, from the East coast or something, and they haven't done any, any downhill stuff. Don't, don't take them on anything, even the easy downhill trails. Cause they don't look ahead and they'll run off on any kind of a switchback, even a mild switchback, I right. mean, a sweeping switchback. They'll run off the trail or they'll, they're putting their feet down. And I'm like, okay, <clears throat> you need to go on to a flat, pretty much flat dirt road to start. And then you're not really learning you're not learning the skills that you need on that flat. So what I'm saying is like, like ride a bike. And, and in this case for, for drawing, it's like any drawing from life is going to help. Any drawing anatomy is going to help. It doesn't have to be specific to um, graphic novels or, or comics. That's my point is that mileage, Mm -hmm. that pencil mileage is really important to get down, to get that, Good motor control, get being able to draw ellipses, um, be able to draw um, simple objects in any place in perspective above the horizon line, below the horizon line, one point, two point, three point, um, mm-hmm. and and being able to um, to do all that stuff. It doesn't matter what you're drawing, but I hear you, Lee. You know, you're saying, well, why not draw the things you like? But I mean, when it Again, no link. We don't have any idea where this person is starting, so we really can't give specific information for for Brian. But yeah, um, but yeah, you you need everything. And the other thing we don't know is what style does he want. There are graphic novel styles that are super primitive that right. don't require a lot of anatomy skills. That's a good. That's a really really good point. Is that sometimes you're not going to you can actually hurt your forward progress if it's not in the vein that you want to do if you're learning three-point perspective but you're doing some primitive kind of kid style it's going to actually confuse you right here's 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 what i would say if you have zero foundational drawing skills and and i'm not going to say this as a this is a plug for svs learn but this is so from my heart because I honestly believe in this, but go sign up for the foundations track. It's 20 classes. It'll take you, if you really take it serious, you know, you could do this whole thing in six months, maybe a year. I'm going to read to you this list of classes. Okay. First class, how to draw everything. And essentially it is, uh, here's how you control, control line mark making on your uh, on a piece of paper. That's where it starts. And it ends with how to make shapes, uh, put shapes together to make actual things, objects. Mm-hmm. But it's a very much a shape-based system of learning how to draw. Then you're going to go do basic perspective. That's a second class. Then there's this really cool class Will teaches called Visualizing Drawing in Perspective, which is less about the rules of perspective and more about Um, like not a a rigid adherence to the rules, but more of like using the concepts to make sure your drawings feel like they're adhering to perspective. Mm -hmm. After that, you've got Lee's incredible class, Light and Shadow for Illustrators. And this is, now you're going to be adding, understanding how to make things look like they're lit, like there's actual atmosphere and, and light in the room. And then we teach color. Then it's Will's The Magic of Color class. And so now you've got all those then we're going to start teaching you how to do actual like drawing things. So the next class is introduction to prop design. That's my class. Then we get figure drawing fundamentals. Then we get gesture drawing class. Then we get unique and appealing character design class. So you are moving from inanimate objects to more to animate objects to characters. 
then it's stylizing human characters, and then it's posing characters. So it's one thing to design, a, do a character design. And in comics, you're going to need to put them in interesting poses. So then you're taking the pose of classes. Then we're moving on to environment stuff. So advanced perspective class taught by David Hone. He's an incredible teacher, one of the best. And I, I can't believe we got him for this, but yeah. he taught us. And we're us, teaching he, this. I'm, let, me, let me stop you real quick. Yeah. Because I want, there's a, a one important thing. These, these classes, these descriptions, A, we made this curriculum very specifically, specifically for an illustrator going through it um, and the order and all that stuff. But all classes aren't the same. Like, for example, if you're like, oh, you know, I've, uh, uh, I'm hearing about Jake saying something about my lighting and shadow class, for example, and you're taking uh, an illustration class at your college and it's light and shadow. The difference between these classes that we put together and the regular community college class is we're gearing them for the real things that happen in the real world as an mm -hmm. illustrator specifically. And a, a quick example of that is, and you guys will probably, if you've taken a class before an illustration or basic painting class, you'll recognize this. When anytime somebody's teaching light, they teach uh, how to shade a ball and they show how the mm -hmm. light falls on the ball and the shadow and all that stuff. Well, it's almost impossible to take that information and say, okay, now go draw a downtown city street scene and light it. You mm -hmm. can't just take render every single thing in an entire scene like you did the ball up mm, close. Right. You know what I mean? Right. And so we talk about like, you'll what do you do crazy. different? Like, yeah, you'll drive yourself nuts. And, and then the ball, the stuff you learn for the ball doesn't apply in a one-to-one -one ratio. And so, and we did that with all the classes, like, okay, here's the principle, but how do you actually use it? How do you scale it? How do you change it for these different things? So just wanted to put that out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's really good. So, um, David Hone, he teaches advanced perspective, and then he follows that up with a class called practical expect perspective. So the first one is here's like these very hard, rigid rules, like this is how you do it. And he's got a cool assignment where he gives you like a, a blueprint of a bedroom. And then your job is to draw that bedroom from the blueprint in perspective. So it's, it's, it's really such a cool thing. So then practical perspective is a little bit more of like, how do you apply that to what you would actually like be drawing for a comic? Okay. Then we got vehicle design. Then we've got our environment like design classes. So I have an exterior design. Wills um, has his interior design. Um, and then we move into the storytelling side. So developing great visual stories is a class, creative composition, building backgrounds for characters, painting color and light. And this is less about, <clears throat> here's how you, you know, here's the, the principles of color, but more like how to use color for storytelling purposes. Um, and then painting textures, and details. And that is our foundations classes. You could subscribe, get access to this, this track for something like 25 bucks a month. Or if you're not into subscriptions, you can buy these as bundles and just own them for life. Um, but I would say go through all of this. If this is something that you're, you're brand new to, to, to drawing, or it's been several years since you've done art, I would absolutely sign up for this. And if it's specifically that you want to learn how to do comics, um, I would be studying, not just reading comics, but studying comics. So look at how uh, the story structure is, is, is done uh, from panel to panel. Look at character development. Look at like all of that kind of stuff is, 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 uh, is just as important as the drawing side of it. But look at how, um, you know, you could take, I do have a, a comics class course as well, which I would recommend doing after you do these foundations one, but you're going to learn a lot just from not just reading comics, but studying comics. And that's what I would do. And I would say you're 34 right now. I would plan on, um, um, taking two or three or four years to really feel like you're, you can, you can do a a pretty good comic if you're starting from, from sea level, <laughs> right? <laughs> Below sea level, right? <laughs> sure. Um, and, uh, and, and that said too, is, uh, I, and I, it's kind of a mix between both Will and Lee's answer, like to do the thing you want to do versus, you know, anything will help. I would also in the middle of all this learning stuff, like just give yourself an assignment to do a short comic story each year, mm. maximum 20 pages. 
Um, and that's what I did. That's how I learned how to draw comics as well as like, I, I did these short stories. You know, the first one I ever did was like five pages. Um, and then I did a 10 page and I did a 14, then I did a 20 and every year I just, I just, that's going to be my, my job this year's is from like my, my personal project is I'm going to do a short comic story and you mm -hmm. learn a ton just from doing that. So you can, what what do you think the main the, the the biggest problem that people have when they start out doing comics? What do you think that is? Um, yeah, the the biggest hurdle I think is, I mean, you're juggling so much. So I, I, <laughs> the thing I see a lot is, um, it's really hard to figure out how to how to place those characters in the environments that they're that they're interacting in and and so that that's one level but then there's this other part where how do i actually um and that's more of an illustrative thing but specific to comics like how do i compose the piece so that the eye goes where it needs to go so the storytelling's clear mm -hmm. and and a lot of times people put the word bubbles in the wrong place or they mm -hmm. You know the word bubbles are so tight that they're crowding the the letters, mm -hmm. and and word bubble management is a big deal with comics. Panel mm -hmm. arrangement is a big deal, um, and so the, the the main number one thing with comics is clarity, mm -hmm. making sure you're telling a very clear story versus a, making a pretty picture. Sometimes I see really beautiful comic pages, but I can't tell what the heck's going on. Right, and I would I would. I wanted to say, because um, I've never made a comic, so take it mm -hmm. for what it's worth. But when I watch a good movie, one thing that I noticed that really good directors do mm -hmm. is they don't put, they, they in the editing, they cut out anything that isn't necessary. Yep. So everything has a reason and everything has a purpose for, and every every camera angle has a purpose and every, mm -hmm. every single thing they do. So in good filmmaking, you 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 can actually as a viewer say hmm why did they put that in there that's mm -hmm. going to be important later on and i would imagine that in good comics that it's the same thing and what i've seen are panels that don't further the story in beginner yeah. uh, comic comic book uh, illustrators is that they they're trying to kind of copy what they th think other illustrators are doing what the good ones mm -hmm. are doing but they don't understand that there was a reason behind a specific panel and anyway. Right. Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay. Well, that's it for today. Should we wrap it up? Yeah, let's wrap. Let's wrap. Wait, before you do, you guys have anything fun you're doing today? No. I do. I have, yeah. I have, um, we have visitors from Utah here. Oh, cool. And they have three little girls, right? One's, like um, under two, and then there's a five year old and there's an eight year old, right? And uh, <laughs> the five year old was like, um, as soon as she got here yesterday, she's like, Jake, I need you to heat up the pool. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, okay, yeah, we'll I'll make sure it's hot and ready to go. And like again last night, she's all tomorrow you're gonna heat up the pool. I said, yeah, I'm going to do it. And so then this morning, I'm, we're doing breakfast. I get up. First thing, she's like, you're going to heat up the pool today, right? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and then, so then I go on my run and I come back and I had heated up the pool, like the jacuzzi part of it. The pool's not frigid. It's Arizona, right? And uh -huh. I did my first pool dunk of the year today, right? So uh -huh. this is, we're recording this in April. So this is, uh, you know. It's a, it's a monumental moment to be able to be able to get back into your pool again. Anyways, um, so I started the the we don't run the the heater for the jacuzzi all the time because that's expensive because we're not in it all the time. Right. So I turn it on as needed usually when we have guests. So I came back in. I'm going up to go like shower and change after my run, and she's like, "Did you turn on the pool? Did you turn on the heat pool? <laughs> yes, I did. It's it's going to be ready." <laughs> It's hilarious. I'm like afraid of this girl. <laughs> like, oh, she's gonna ask me. <laughs> she's leaning on you. Yeah. I'm gonna do it right. 
These are Jake problems. I need to heat up my pool and my jacuzzi. I don't have these problems. These are Jake problems. It's because you live in uh, in Colorado. It'd be ab- it's absolutely necessary. I know, I know, I know. It was 110 when we were there last year. I, I get it. <laughs> Remember when we were walking around at night and it was like, you're like, how come it isn't cooling off? It's 100 degrees <laughs> at night. Yeah. It's like 100 degrees. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. Bizarre. <laughs> All right, take us out, Jake. Wait. I am, I'm the only one that said uh, what I was doing. I because already did I my had... fun thing today. I went for a bike ride. Oh, Lee? I'm sick, and so I'm just kind of just like moping around. <laughs> we're we're living vicariously out. through you, Jake. All right, guys. <laughs> All right. I'll send pics hanging out in the pool. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Three Point Perspective is made possible by svslearn.com, where becoming a great illustrator starts. Your hosts have been Will Terry, Lee White, and I'm Jake Parker. I want you to go to Will Terry's website. It's willterry.com. Lee White's website, I want you to go there. It's leewhiteillustration.com. And I want you to go to my website. It's mrjakeparker.com. Podcast produced by Daniel Tu. That's danieltu.co. Special thanks to Master Production David Bro. Keeper of the curriculum, Austin Shirtliff, and a, a big shout out to him because we talked about the, the foundation's curriculum um, today, and he has been like instrumental in making sure all these classes work together and that the assignments are the right assignments for the right class, and 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 uh, so a big thank you to him for for d- doing all that. Uh, Chief Operations Officer Lisa Fott, and a big thank you to Lily Howell for our show notes. Now, go draw something. Hey, what did you guys think of the new Spider-Man, the the No Way Out or No Way? What it's is no it? No Way Home. No Way Home. Spider-Man, No Way Home. We, uh, we we started it, but and it was really good, but we were kind of falling asleep, so we um, decided to save it for when we were awake. I was talking to my kids the other day. We were talking about all the different Spider-Mans, and we're like, what's the... What's the next Spider-Man movie gonna be? And I, I love joking with them, uh-huh. <laughs> and so I'm like, I got guys. The next one's called Spider Dad. I got bit by a radioactive dad, and now I'm, uh, now I'm Spider Daddy, and it's called Spider Daddy Fart at Home. <laughs> wow, that was that's elaborate. Were, Did you just come up with that on the spot? I was, I was washing dishes and doing it. The kids just died laughing. <laughs> That's pretty good. Bit by a radioactive dad. Was that an April Fool's joke? What? No, it's not an April. Why would that be an April Fool's joke? April Fool's is where you you really trick them. I don't this know. Is, is there, I didn't know that there was a, a category of kind of kind of tricks. I had a great April Fool's to both my family and uh, my wife and and son. I I got them pretty good. But anyway, let's talk about Spider Man. Well, pause. The fact that you asked if my joke was my just a joke was an April Fool's thing, like well, makes no, me seriously question what how you understand April Fools. Is it just like a day April to tell Fools jokes? has no no? That's not a joke. You're basically alluding to the, well, unless he knew it was a joke. See, I mean, yours is far fetched enough, and your kids are smart and old enough yeah. to know that was a joke. But see, yeah. if I said that to my it, Emerson, my son, when he was nine, he'd believe it and be like. You know, I could keep running oh, with it. I get it. what so, you're saying. But I was like, yeah. really like, no, no, See, the next come movie's like, uh, You don't do like Spider a knock, Dad. knock, knock, knock joke and then say that's April Fool's. That okay. I get, it's I understand. Like... <laughs> my April Fool's to my son was I told him that his his bank account got hacked and he's lost all his savings. And he cried, didn't he? Oh, it was rough. Yeah, you can't do that. <laughs> Here's that's here's horrible. the here's what I did with my kids. Yeah, screw him up so much. <laughs> about, about 10 years ago, I said, hey, have you guys seen the new movie Vampires versus Aliens? And I hooked them so good. They were See, like, that's oh. the that's the exact thing I'm talking about. And it. when I asked Jake, and, and I, the and thing is, I leave it, I leave it until they until they come home, going, "Dad, you lied to us." <laughs> See, the, okay, so here's my <laughs> April Fool's philosophy, right? It's <laughs> it's a, a joke that it, uh, you need to play a joke that is victimless, so that nobody really feels bad. At the end of the day. Wait, time, right. time out. Can we just acknowledge that Jake has a list for April Fool's jokes? It's just, <laughs> so number, just one. <laughs> number one. It's it's a good April Fool's joke is vic- victimless, right? So it's it's good natured, good fun. So number two, ready for this? And actually, two and three are are, are one and the same. There's believable, and there's absolutely 
bonkers ridiculous. And the perfect April jo- Fool's joke exists where those two just barely overlap. Yeah, I agree. That's what, that's you vampires know? versus aliens. Vampires, that's a perfect <laughs> April Fool's joke. Your kid telling your kid that he lost, that his, his account got hacked? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't just know woke the, up. I don't. I, and I realized I saw it. Emerson, my, Emerson, wake my up! <laughs> your account got hacked. You lost all your money. <laughs> no, but then, then the the You're relief, ruined. the relief that sweeps over him when he finds out it's April Fools makes it worth it. So there's a proportional element there. Yeah. Despair to elation is proportional. How about this one? How about this one? You tell your your kid who's you know, maybe last year or two years ago found out about Santa, but you sit him down and you're like, okay, we need to tell you something. We lied that Santa's us. He's actually real. Like, <laughs> wait, 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 what are you talking about? You do the reverse, <laughs> the reverse <laughs> lie. Are you, That's what are you saying about psychotic Santa? Right I don't there. understand. <laughs> Lee, who do you think puts the presents <laughs> under the tree? It's Lisa. Santa. <laughs> I don't know. I just go to bed at nine o'clock uh, the night before Christmas and a bunch of presents end up under yeah. the tree. I don't know. Oh, no, no. Okay. Here's the, here's a good Too one. Much hot chocolate and wash, uh, <laughs> wet the bed. Here's, here's the perfect one. I was, I was mixing up leftovers, making a meal out of it. There were some potatoes mm-hmm. and, and stuff like that. And my kids come out and they're like, this is a long time ago. And they're like, Oh, what, Ooh, what are we having? You know? And I'm, and I'm like, immediately I'm like, you guys have never had this before. It's called foxhole hash. <laughs> and they're like, what? And I'm like, yeah, in World War One, when the when the when they didn't have much else, they had foxhole hash, and they were dang happy to have it. So they're <laughs> they're chowing down, right? But I didn't. What I didn't see was them a year later going to um, their scout meeting and having oh, a guy no. from World War Two. Actually, I said World War Two. No, a yeah. guy, a a guy from World Actual. War Two, come and talk. And my son's all, hey, tell us about the foxhole hash. And he's like, what? And so they come home, dad, you lost. <laughs> oh, that's so good. <laughs> so Wait, in, you never told Will's them? House. You just let them, you just let them hang? Yeah, See, well, the they, were, they were eating. They were, uh, you know, appreciating uh, a leftover meal. See, and and that's the thing. It's the, to the point in our home where whenever I say anything at the dinner table or or any sort of like well you know kids and i list some sort of fact or some sort of knowledge the kids always nod and they're very respectful and then i see him glance over at mom like <laughs> and mom has to go yeah or no <laughs> <laughs> that's how it is <laughs> Anyways, back to Spider Man. I want to, yeah. I was gonna say, I was gonna say that this is this is why we're not more successful. Is it we is, start out talking true. about Spider Man, and we end up with a you know twenty minute interlude of, of April Fools and what constitutes a joke. And now we're back to Spider Man. It's we get we, nothing we're getting done. Detoured we get nothing on our detour. <laughs> it's Inception stories, is what it is. <laughs> okay, but Spider Man Far From Home is a good movie. It's a, it's a really, it's okay. Well, we, we will finish it and we will enjoy it. All yeah. of them have been good. I, I like the themes, you know, how many times can they make Spider-Man, but all of them have been pretty fun. And then, you know, it's funny because the theme runs through the Batman. They're all just really dark or they try to be dark. Even those ones back in the nineties or whatever, were more, were darker than the Spider-Man ones. Um, so it's interesting to watch. I just don't know how many times you can remake something and have it be, Interesting, but I will say this out of all the superhero movies, my favorite moment of all of them is, and I don't know why this is, but it's when the character just figures out they have powers, but they don't really know how to use them yet. And they're just kind of discovering what those powers are. It's always just a fun little moment. I don't care about when they're trying to catch the bad guys at the end and saving Mm -hmm. the world, but it's always interesting. I mean, maybe because that's the most plausible part that people that you'd think about in your day, like, oh, I got bit by a spider yesterday. And all of a sudden you can like kind of cl- sort of climb up the walls, but not good at it yet. I just love mm-hmm. that, that kind of ex- exploration there. I don't know yeah. why. Yeah. The learning, the learning phase, the the new superhero, like in that original Superman movie where, um, he like all of a sudden the powers kick in and he's like racing the train and throwing the baseball and like leaping and, and all that stuff. That's, right. That's that's it's good so stuff. fun, yeah, yeah, for real. Um, what's cool about that Spider-Man movie though is it's like an unexpected, um, like 
unexpected wrap up of all the versions of Spider-Man put together. Like, like you didn't realize that this trilogy of Tom Holland Spider-Mans is actually like tying up in a bow <clears throat> all the it, previous iter- iterations of live action. Okay, Spider-Man. but you're not going to give me spoilers, right? Not going to give you spoilers. Okay. But at this point, you've seen the trailer and yeah, you kind of you kind of know what you're in for. I don't know a whole lot. I try not to watch the trailers, actually. I look All away. Right. Well, I don't want to turn into a pillar of salt when I watch those things. Yes, you don't want to do that. Yeah. Have you been taking your allergy medicine? Good. Good. This yeah. is... Uh, I'm, like your, I'm like your mom. <laughs> this is a health. It's the knockoff of um, Zyrtec. Do, do you want to hear something dumb? Yeah. Every time I've ever taken allergy medication, it was like twice a day. So I was taking this twice a day and I was feeling like I was drunk. And then Lily's like, that's 24 hours. It's one every 24 hours. <laughs> Idiot. That's why you have this headache and everything. I'm You're like OG feeling man. like I'm out of body. Like my my spirit's walking five feet in front of me kind of a thing. <laughs> That's horrible. I did the, one time. This was like I was in my early twenties. Um, I have asthma, and so one day, like asthma was just really kicking it hard. And I used to take this. I used to take this pill for it instead of inhalers. Mm-hmm. And for some reason, my inhalers weren't working or whatever. I couldn't find them, but I found a bottle of these pills. Mm-hmm. It's called Theodore, oh I think is what it was. Theodore? Theodore, I think is what it was. I can't remember. Anyway, so I'm like, I'll just take one of these. And so I took it. I run off to college, to whatever class I was in. And by the time I got to school, I'm like, ooh, you know, doing that weird, like you're saying, like, <laughs> uh-huh. you know, everything's weird and uh-huh. and just feeling awful. And I finally, I like make it back home after school and just dealing with that all day. And I go to check the pills, and they're like way expired. <laughs> Classic. So there you go. It's not fun. People that don't have allergies, and they're like, "What's your problem?" You're mm-hmm. like, "Why are you sniffling and, and stuff?" And it's like, I want to kill them, but I but I don't want to kill anyone. So I have to deal. I have to just. Put up with them. Imagine if if you could just solve your problems by killing people. <laughs> you don't get to live anymore because you offended me. Um, That's like no, a I, Deadpool thing. <laughs> it's the worst though. The allergies. Oh my gosh. Okay. I ready, think Lee? that I'm ready. Yep. Okay. Here we go. Is I am going to give you a lesson, the best lesson that we're ever going to give. Mm-hmm. The best pro tip, and it's going to be called three point perspective. Whoa! So Whoa. it's not just a, a clever name; it actually means something. That's right. It's not just a podcast anymore. It's actually okay. a thing. So, um, no, but but uh, like a lot of people, when I posted this online, the, a lot of the comments I got was, "Man, how do you come up with these views?" You know, like, Mm -hmm. like, where does that come from? How do you, how do you draw a view like that? You know, and it's really simple. It's, it's all it is, is I'm telling you is all it is, is learning three point perspective. So like, turn off that layer really quick right now and just, well, let me, let me show a few images. So to, to create a dynamic image, you know, you want to, uh, 